Hi everyone, this is Roman with Holistic Dog Training and today we're going to touch a kind of sensitive theme and it's about how to safely pet sit dogs and we're going to go about these traumatic incidents that happened a um, couple of days ago and we go kind of deep tissue so it doesn't happen again. And yep, I'm... Where am I? <laughs> Hi guys, how are you doing? I'm Roman with Holistic Dog Training. And um, before I become a trainer, I used to do a lot of pet sitting jobs. Um, I started with dog walking and I started with in-home boarding. And then I continue to start working with more and more reactive and difficult dogs. So I've been through this process of working with dogs who are considered dangerous and i was lucky to never been severely hurt on that job and um, so i'm talking a from experience as a pet sitter but also i'm talking about as experience as a trainer and we want to talk about um that so viewers discretion advised because we're going to touch sensitive matter and my condolences to any family that had this experience either with their dogs or as a, as a professional. So when I started working as a behaviorist, I was very interested to look into why dogs do things they do that causes people such a traumatic experience. And one thing that I saw through all these fatalities on people through dog incidents, there was always a factor of a stranger or always a factor of a dangerous situation that was clearly possible. And I was never able to clearly identify it was the dog's fault. The dogs did what they did, but it wasn't the dog's fault that happened. So there was an outside factor that happened. So let me give you a little bit of um, uh, background. So without going into names and etc. So um, a young lady um, in Texas went to pet sitting job, took on a dog walking job because the owners of that family had two dogs and children and dogs got rescued got from rescues the one was a shepherd mix and the other one was is called boxer mix anyway and both were mixes breed mixes both were considered safe to be in a home with a family with kids so this family had kids and a family and because they were busy both were professionals they had a dog sitter take care of the dogs which is very very good to do that means people take care of the dogs and now what happened was the pet sitters was the first job obviously and what happened next changed the pet sitters life forever and of course the dogs and the families um so here is the little bit of the details and maybe you want to give me you're gonna if you are not capable of listening to it i'm gonna give you a timeout and then I give you a thumbs up when these details are over. So I'm starting now. So the pet sitter went home and opened the door. The dogs were fine to that point. She entered the house and the alarm triggered in the house. The dog was secured. The house was secured. So the pet sitter opens the door, goes in. The alarm sense goes off and the dogs attack the person at her face and would not stop for the next 32 minutes until a neighbor heard the whole thing and called the cops. The cops came in and had a hard time getting in the house because of these two dogs challenging. Okay. Now back to the details, to the regular normal details. What, what the first thing that I wondered was, how is it possible that this dog who have seen obviously the pet sitter before because the pet sitter was there once before, were be able to do this kind of damage and what triggered it. Um, so 
looking deeper into all the reports that were available online without knowing the details and without doing assessment on the dogs, I'm just looking into possibilities, is that the owners knew about the dog's reactivity on the doorbell. So the door ringing was a trigger, and so they were announcing to their people and to the pets to not ring the doorbell when coming home. 80% of people ask the people not to ring the doorbell because the dogs get upset, right? That's normal. So there was nothing wrong with that. But the other part is that the dog sitter wasn't friends with the dogs. He was just doing the job. And, you know, as a dog sitter, you're being introduced to the dogs. The dogs come here. They're very gentle, super awesome, right? And then, you know, well, job looks good. Dogs are friendly. Kids are around, nobody's in, in fear. The doc, the person takes a job on, and next day the people are gone. He goes to the job and opens the door, goes in, and you know, in the panic mode, you type eventually the alarm system wrong. Like right? that's what you do sometimes. And I remember having from each address um, having people's codes on, on the door so I can enter safely without triggering the alarm. And that, well, that went wrong. So the person wasn't able to disarm the alarm. The dogs got triggered by the alarm, right? And in that panic slash PTSD response, in the fear response, the dogs attacked the intruder. In that moment where the dogs are triggered in survival response, they did not recognize that they have seen that person before. And the story went endless. Now, who started it? Which dog of those two dogs started it is unknown. Because unless there was a video footage of the situation, nobody really know what happened. Okay? So these little, little two fellas, this German Shepherd mix, and this other mixed dog, um, is what did the, job, the damage. Now... <clears throat> It's not happened the first time. It happened multiple times with different homes, with different dogs over the last years. Um, and how can we change that? How can a pet sitter do the job safely and not getting in harm's way? Because honestly, it's not a well-paid job. People think it's a well-paid job because they have to pay like $17, $25, $32 an hour for having the pet sitter coming in, not recognizing that this pet sitter can only take one dog at a time or one family at a time. Then he has a travel to go back and forth. And then he has to care for the dog in a, in a professional manner. So in that case, you have, let's say if you're a smart pet sitter and you have this whole block of houses, you go past house, you have a peak time around lunch or in the breakfast or in the afternoon, depending on what kind of plans you have, and you want to try to get as many dogs in as possible. Now, I was lucky back then because I was I specialized. I had this niche of working with aggressive dogs. And I, I charged $75 per visit. Right? And people were like, what? 73? Are you kidding me? You're stealing people's money. Well, I could only take so many dogs at a day. So I had only three or four dogs a day. And that's everything. So... Seven dogs, oh, sorry, four dogs a day, four visits a day. That was it. And I would put myself to danger, and I had a lot of experience to offer. So it, it comes with a cost to do that kind of service. Now, so what else do we have as an issue? We have the issue that people are confused of what the, do, what the pet sitter's job description is. So the pet sitter's job description is to provide daily care while the owners are absent from the house, which includes letting the dogs out of the crate eventually if the dogs are crated, taking the dogs out for a walk if the dog needs to be walked, uh, playing with the dogs in the yard if there's a yard available, or taking the dogs in a play course or you know, play date or in a dog park and have them sometimes Pet sitters have to collect the mail, bring the mail back in. Sometimes they have to water the plants. It, the job can expand a little bit, but mainly it's about the dogs and attached pets, like cats and birds and whatever other fishes stuff in there. Sometimes this job has to be done 
once a day, sometimes twice or three times a day, and sometimes it has to be over a long period of time because the people going on vacation. Now, what can go wrong right there? The first thing that go wrong is the assumption that's because the dogs feel comfortable with the pet sitter in a new home when the visit came in, that the dogs are ready to go. Not, not paying attention to the dog is calm because the owners are there. So the dogs are not territorial about the pet sitter because the owners let the dog, the person, sorry, the pet sitter in the house, and the dogs are fine with that. They have many times coming people into the house. But what happens if that pet sitter comes in alone? What is the situation? First of all, the dog does know who's at the door until the door opens or he knows who is behind the door because it's the main door and it's not the garage door many people walk into the garage doors in their home and they're not walking into the main door so the dog knows the difference garage door safe entrance unsafe and the first thing that i say to people the first thing is where do your friends come in and where do visitors come in to make that distinction so I understand what risk I'm taking in. The next thing I would do, what's going to happen if I ring the doorbell and I physically have them do it? And then I see what's going on with that. And it's not just the doorbell, don't get me wrong. It's anything that is out of the ordinary that will trigger the dog. It could be a fire alarm. It could be the alarm system. It could be anything out of the ordinary that a dog is not used to and suddenly happens. Okay, that's why dogs also react when the lawnmower guys come and fix your lawn and they get upset because all of a sudden this machinery is running. The other thing that we need to pay attention to is the habits. So dogs are habitual animals who will be coming in the door, right? Your parents or, you know, family. And suddenly it's a stranger. What do we expect the dog to do? What would we want the dog to do if a stranger suddenly invades the house? right? Well, it's a thief. We should take the dog down, right? So how does the dog distinct this difference between family member and thief? Just because he has a key? What do you expect the dog to do? Be a in, in, intuit person? Like intuitively figure out who is going to open the door? It's not going to happen. So for the dog, it's a stranger if it's not family. It's a stranger if it doesn't behave like family. It's a stranger if it doesn't look like family. It's a stranger if it doesn't smell like family. So it depends on how the dog perceives the person who comes in the house. Some dogs have olfactory systems that rely on, like, oh, are my parents? Or they look at it they're like, oh, are the ones I know, right? And then the other part that's very dangerous here is the stress factor, because even if the dog smells the person, saw the person, if anything happens out of the ordinary and the dog goes into a stress level, he doesn't really have access to his memory. What he has access to is his body memory. And that's where the problem becomes serious, because in the dog's go into fight or flight response, he will fight or run off. Now, you have two dogs into the equation, and I will tell you a story in a bit. So hold on there. And by the way, have your coffee. When, when the dogs are two dogs, they work a synergistic couple. It's a dog, one dog who makes decision and the other dog who follows. Now, if the dog who makes decision is a fearful dog, he will trigger the other dog to become fearful as well because dogs will share their emotions. So if a dog says, shit, we're in the attack, then the other guy has to comply to that alarm and attack as well to defend the one who is afraid until he figures out what's going on. So dogs don't have much time to act. And dogs are one of the fastest species that we have in our environment when it comes down to making decisions. From my calculations, observing slow motion videos, I noticed that dogs can make 14 actions per second. That's a lot. A pilot on Navy has to make like nine decisions per second. And you know, flying a plane in crisis, 
and those dogs can go faster than that. Think of how long does it take you to step on the brakes if somebody in front of you steps on the brakes? Well, remember, you have to keep distance because it takes you like three seconds, right? And in these three seconds, a whole situation has happened for the dogs, and you will not be able to remember what actually happened because you're in it. Now, let's talk about a little story that I had um, back maybe maybe 10 years, seven years ago. I got a phone call from a follower on Facebook, and she found my phone number from, from the website. So she calls me, like, I have an issue. I'm like, okay, well, I'm pet sitting those two kid courses. And I was like, oh, okay, so what's going on? She's like, I cannot get in the house. I was like, that's good. <laughs> it's safe. This is no. And people left and they're on the flight. And uh, the dogs don't let me coming in. I, said, I tried to get in and they're attacking me at the door. I said, okay, now you have the key, close the door. And I would like you to go to the gas station and get those long hot dogs. You know, not hot dogs, you know, this salami things that you get in the gas station and i want to get a couple of those like maybe 10 of those and go back in the house and open the door and toss a treat in there because i knew from a fact that these dogs will not attack each other on that one we had a conversation before that and soon enough she was able after half an hour conditioning the dog what's going to happen if the door opens to safely get in the house and take the dogs finally out for a walk. And that was the end of the problem. Now, if she would not call me or she would not think clearly and she would insist to get into the house because sometimes we are blind, folded by the dog, by the, by the job, not think through it, to just do what we always do, she could eventually get harmed. <clears throat> and the dog had shown aggression to strangers before, so she was smart enough to do multiple visits before that and they were considered safe. But they didn't think of what would happen if the person wasn't there that owns the dogs. Now, another difficult situation happened if dogs are sick and you have to take care of sick dogs, right? Now, there are other issues coming in because some sick dogs are not aware of clear of the environment or are on the medication and they can react more aggressively. Dogs who are may have a medication, pain medication or anxiety medication may react aggressively towards the environment. So you just want to go in, you know, take the cats out and, you know, prepare the food, get the cat can, open the can, you know, all the fish smell goes all over the house. The dog is like, holy burgers, food in place, right? And since the dog's owner is not there and you're not being able to create exactly 100% the same ritual, the dog gets stressed about it. And he has two options or three options, going after the cat, going after you or going after the can. And here's you put yourself in the danger because all of a sudden the dog naturally starts becoming aggressive because of this new factor and he cannot predict what's going to happen. So he's stressed because his people are gone. He's stressed because food is out there. He's stressed because the cat is nearby. And he's stressed because there's a new person coming in. That's a recipe for disaster right there. Right? And if the dog is even sick under influence of medication, that adds on top of it. And then, because that's not enough, you have the delivery guy show up at the door. Ding dong, I got your package. Kaboom. Right? Now, there are multiple things that can happen there as well as some professionals are not professional dealing with animals. They're tough people, like they're going hard on dogs because they watched videos, you know, the wrong videos and had this wrong belief system about how to handle dogs. They have not done any course on any educational background. All they do is they just want to make money and the cheapest way to make money without overhead cost is taking a pet sitting job. You can still be in high school and get a pet sitting job. Like, give me a break. Easy. Take a bicycle, go to the neighbors, take your dog out, right? But if things get a little bit more complicated and you start working with dogs who have behavior issues and you're not knowing what to do and you take them for a walk and you do that what you saw on TV and start choking the dog because he's going to pull out the door and that dog doesn't know you well, he's going to go after you, right? Another example, people get attacked by 
pet sitters get attacked by the client's dogs when they're out on the walk through redirected aggression. So they're going down the street, the dog is barking to the neighbors, and you know, as a pet sitter, you want to show off a little bit and you want to make sure that nobody is pointing the finger on the pet, pet sitter or dog walker. And the person would kind of crack the dog in one way or the other that he saw fit to do. And the dog, of course, gets upset and frustrated about the situation because instead of being empathetic with the situation he's dealing with, he's being corrected and punished for having those emotional outbursts for a reason. And I mean, the reason why the dog is frustrated is justified, but not the reason why the handler or the caregiver or the pet sitter corrects the dog for any way. And I know dog sitters who take the dogs out on a shock collar or in a prong collar because it's their suggestion, by the way. So these are things that can cause the dog a meltdown. And I have a story for that too, okay? Um, I give you again a timeout for you guys who are sensitive. Good. And so I, I worked with a person who had an issue with his dog, his personal dog, and I was called in to help them. And I saw that things are not going the right way in the household because the way the relationship was set up was wrong and the way the people handled the dog was not right. And I was suspicious about it, to the point that I actually called animal control and had a discussion, a conversation, how we can safely remove the dog from the family. And another colleague stepped in and wanted to help as well. And the whole thing kind of fell apart. And at the end was that I wasn't, I was kind of fired because there was another professional out there thinking they can do the job. And the dog ended up attacking the person very aggressively to the point that um, I'm not sure now if neighbors shoot the dog or police officers shoot the dog, but the dog got killed. Okay, now, these are sad stories, and it can happen at anyone. You are not excluded from it. And here are a few things that you should want, want to mind when you hire a pet sitter. First of all, you need to know the pet sitter's professional history. Who is the person? What has it done before? You have to do a background check. There are people out there who want to steal dogs. And there are pet sitters out there who will play the game. They get money for walking the dog in a specific area where the dogs can get kidnapped, for example, right? Now, people are smart. They have the dog's GPS collar on, right? And everything is fine. And suddenly, the GPS collar adds up somewhere else. And the other thing that we need to look for is how much experience does this person has with dogs? Now, remember this. You're not hiring a dog trainer and you don't hiring a professional trainer or a behaviorist or a veterinary behaviorist. You hire a person who loves dogs and want to care for dogs and he has passion with dogs. That's it. Okay? So if you want to build a house, you don't hire a landscaper. You hire a builder. And you don't expect the builder to make you a sky razor because then you need a whole factory of people to make that building. So if you think on dog, if you want a pet sitter, you hire a pet sitter. If you want a trainer, you hire a trainer to teach your dog tricks and etc. If you need a behaviorist because your dog has behavior issues, you cannot hire a pet sitter who is good with dogs to save you the money of a behaviorist thinking that if my pet sitter takes a dog off enough who has a clue, he's going to train my dog for $20 an hour. <laughs> Give me a break. Come on, seriously, right? Do you agree with me? Is this what happens often? Right? Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it for that feedback. And of course, you're welcome to share that. It's shareable. So you can share it from my business page, Holistic Dog Training, um, not from a group, unfortunately. Now, many of my viewers have reactive dogs. They have Mastiff, Mastiff breeds, Cane Corso, Presa Canario, Bull Mastiffs, English Mastiffs, you name it. And then we have the other group of people who follow me who have guardian breeds, um, herding breeds, and heavy working breeds. Now, 
these people or you people struggling most with that because you have guardian breeds who are sensitive to strangers. Now, people who says, you know, those guardian breeds, it's, it's a breed trait. No, it's not a breed trait. Being aggressive to people, being aggressive in general, it's not the breed trait. Aggression is a tool to survive. And a dog does need to be aggressive if his life is not in threat or whatever he perceives is threatened. So a dog is only aggressive if something is at risk. And your job as a professional caregiver, <laughs> right, is to A, educate those people what their job is and clarify them what your job is. And you are a great professional if you reach out for help to another professional and tells them, hey, I'm a dog walker. I'm good at what I do, but listen, you need a professional. I have a list of professionals to recommend you to and come up with your safety list. If you refer a professional trainer or, um, sorry, let's call it the right way, if an, an, a, a professional with credential to help you out with a client, you're going to get clients in return. Right? So refer people to help your clients. Makes you look good, makes your client looks good, makes the professional looks good, makes the dog survive. That's your job as a pet sitter, to make the dog's life not easy, but the dog's wellness is secured. I know, and I have done it before. Many pet sitters go beyond what we consider pet sitting and do what the person tells them to do. And actually for the first time ever offer the dog a real quality of life. And that's key. So if you want to hire a pet sitter, my first question would be, would you leave your three year old with that person and you go for vacation? Yes, no. If the answer is no, don't hire that person. If you cannot trust your three year old, don't trust your dog. As simple as that. And you ask me why? Because you don't want to lose your house. That's why. Simple as that. Because if a person can handle a three year old and you feel good about that person, that he's professional, he's in time, he has references, he, he, he behaves professionally, he's not going to screw you over and you're not going to lose your house. Right? Now, going back to the family who, whose dogs attack this person, like in Texas, these people are highly educated and have good jobs. Okay? Now, they're all over the news. And they have to pay a lot of money for it. Why? Because there are professionals out there who are specialized to do exactly that. Take their money and share that with the victim. And of course, they get a huge package out of it, right? Because they've become famous for a moment. You don't want to be that person. So you have to think smart. You can only hire a professional that has credential, has reviews, and have done the job before. Not once, not twice, like multiple times. And don't hesitate to ask for references. Not his uncle and his sister. Professionals like you, right? And how long has this person worked? Is the person still working with the person he got the reference for? And how long do they work? What kind of dogs do they have? So if this professional is specialized with small breeds and geriatric dogs, and you have a husky, I wouldn't hire a person. Why would I? Because the person has no clue about how husky has to be exercised. So you need a professional that actually knows the breed. So he can offer a service for the dog based on his breed needs. Right? I know many people who took a job on of a bulldog. And the bulldog died in their care. Why? Because they didn't know how to care for it. I know people who took on a dog or a mastiff breed. And they didn't know the breed well. And they thought they can do certain things and they get hurt. So the damage can go both ways. You can hurt the dog, you can hurt the person. But who hired the person in the first place is the one who owns the dog. So this is where the problem starts. You have to know who you hire. 
there are websites out there they promise you the length of the shorts and whatever and have all this app set up but literally all the person has to do to get on that app and get hired is answer the questions right there's nobody checking that person so what i would do is make an appointment on monday take a day off get your car leave the property and wait for the pet sitter to show up is the pet sitter showing up on time check is the pet sitter how long does it take to take the dogs out check how long and which directions and how is the person walking the dogs? check what is the route the person takes the dogs check now the person comes back to the house how long did he walk the dogs check the next thing is going to do is how long does it take him to get out of the house check something like that okay job description varied so if you have a client and he hires you for half an hour of a walk and it takes you 15 minutes to get out of the house how long the dogs will take out for a walk right and what is the client expects too many things to do and you're like whoa you know in a half an hour i need to walk the dogs for 20 minutes right so if you want me to water the plants take your mail in and vacuum the entrance and blah 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 hey listen i cannot do that job add another half an hour and i'll do it right for example because what's going to happen is if the dog gets frustrated right and the dog pans up his frustration and then one day you're going to take the dogs out for a walk after three or four rounds right and the dog is so frustrated and you have to so hard to handle that dog because people rely on you and then what's going to happen is the dog going to redirect the aggression towards you because you holding the leash and the dog is frustrated and you do do you make the mistake now how can we prevent as professionals as trainers and, and behaviorists go out for a walk and see how people walk their dogs like a good example is new york you see new york pet sitters i think new york pet sitters do an amazing job doing what they're doing and those little black sheeps like really black sheeps like bad sheeps what they do is they have like 15 20 dogs looks great and those dogs are just stressed they're being dragged from one place to another some of them are coupled with other dogs because the person cannot handle hold so many leashes and they really walk down the aisle just dogs don't even have time to pee so it's all about moving the dogs from point a to point b okay and the lucky one is good and the not lucky one is being dragged all over the place i've seen a pet sitter when i was driving in new york actually choking the dog between his legs and his neck because the little dog got tangling with a too long leash and instead of holding the whole group of dogs and calm them down and help the dog untangle himself he was pulling on that leash until the dog unrolled himself out of the leash i was not able to jump off the car because i was in the midst of the traffic but you need to know who you hire right and sometimes you have to do the extra mile you have a dog you have a responsibility that dog has the right to proper care and if you hire somebody who doesn't provide proper care then you have a problem and if you're a pet sitter or a trainer and a behaviorist and you go into that family and you don't see proper care it's your responsibility to point it out to them and tell them hey let me explain to you i know you don't have that experience but let me tell you as a professional these are a few things that you need to do okay your dog's water bowl should be full of water <coughs> so if i'm coming home and i don't see a full water bottle i worry that the dog has an issue right and so i will call you and tell you the dog's water bowl is empty and you will respond to me oh i filled it up in the water in the morning no it's not you didn't because that ball is dry so does the dog have a kidney issue does the dog have a sugar problem what's the problem of the dog that i have to refill the ball before 11 o'clock or you can tell them hey the water ball is too small or you know maybe you want to run the ball once in a while in the dishwasher is it okay if i put the dishwasher ball put a new one on the like the dog needs fresh water every day in a clean bowl that you theoretically will be able to drink out of it 
kind of clean, right? And then a pet sitter can also suggest people to feed healthier food. It's it's your job as a professional to be responsible for the care of the dog, which means water and food, right? Give them a heads up. Hey, you know what? That Rich Ray food you buy for your dog, it's so much crap, right? Here's my suggestion. Buy this food that's healthier. Things cost a little bit more, but you have to feed less. Therefore, it comes as equal price than the cheap food, and your dog will be happier with that. And people will appreciate you. You don't need to blame them. What crappy food are you feeding your dog? You can tell them, hey, I got a better option, a healthy option. Your dog will love you even more. People will buy it. They love the love dogs them back, right? And the other thing you want to pay attention to is how they treat their dog in general. If you see signs of abuse, it's your responsibility to act upon Knowing that they use, they abuse the dog makes you part of the problem. And if you don't do nothing about it, and you're not going to lose your job, you're going to save a dog. That's your job. And you're not going to lose it because the dogs up there will notice that. And we're going to send you more clients your way because you care for the collective. Now I said it. Now I said it. I cannot take it back again. So now you know it. So if you see abuse, Take measures, call animal control, discuss the situation, okay? Ask them what to do next because there is a system and a pattern behind that. If a person abuses a dog, he can abuse a person. You don't trust me? Ask the FBI. And if you see a pattern of abuse and you see what that injury was not there yesterday and if you tell the client, hey, you know, I saw your dog has a cut on his leg and he's like, yeah, well, who took care of it? And take a picture with a timestamp on, keep yourself safe. Okay, so a person cannot tell you, you did it. Now, if you bring back the dog home, vet the dog, pet him, and as you pet him, see of anything uneven on his body. I remember I had a client back in 2010, uh, and it was very nice people. And they have a child that had this awesome dog. He was a little bit challenging because he was kind of like rough on the walk. And every time I returned home, I was petting the dog and I was touching his skin. I felt suddenly a lump underneath, like, hmm, that wasn't there yesterday. So I took his picture and I circled it. And I said, hey, when you come back home, do you mind like checking your dog on your left side and see if you notice anything weird? I didn't tell them the dog has cancer. I didn't tell them. I wasn't, I didn't have the diagnostic test. I just told them to confirm what I feel, which was a lump, which saved the dog, by the way, because the dog had cancer and just popped up there, like in a one day to the other. And they were able to save the dog, and the dog lived another three years. That kind of work you do as a pet sitter. And as a client, this is kind of pet sitter you want to hire. No, I'm not to hire for pet sitting right now. But when you hire a pet sitter, you need to understand that pet sitter is your extension. It's another you taking care of your dog better than you. As simple as that. Why? Because it's a professional and you're just a dog lover and you love your dog. That's all you do. Okay. Now, if you hire a trainer to do a pet sitting job, what do you expect to happen? He's going to train your dog, right? So sometimes doing a combination, hire a professional to train your dog in your absence, it's also a risky slippery slope because you don't know what the trainer will do at your house in your absence. And again, my question, would you leave the dog with that person? Okay. Would you leave your three-year-old staying with that person for three hours to being trained like boot camp training because that person has experience with military dogs? Or he explains to you exactly how you pick the back leader. These are red flags. So what you want to look for is how he describes himself. Ask simple question. Hey, you take my dog for a walk. Your dog is, you know, barking at the other door. What do you do? Like, fill me in so I can do that too. And he's going to show off. And he's going to tell you exactly what to do. And you're like, you know, I watched Roman's video the other day. And I don't think it's a good idea. Just because my dog reacts to a reaction and to an event, I don't need to react aggressively towards my dog to show him who's the boss. 
no, that's not going to happen. So I appreciate your feedback. Here's the door. Good luck. And the next thing you do is you open your laptop and type in the review for that trainer. So nobody else falls for it. It's your obligation to warn others from your personal experience. Uh, do you ashamed to warn others for not ruining the dogs and become statistics? I wouldn't. I would be very grateful if I'm going to a website and see, oh, this person had actually a negative review and a holy shit, right? Yes, it happens. Some people just give negative reviews because they're jerks. Because, But if you read the review carefully, you will see this person has nothing to do with the trainer in particular. He's not upset about the trainer. He's upset about the service he offers because that's why you hire the trainer to do a specific service. It's not personally it was Joe. It's how Joe works that the problem makes. Because that trainer can do so much damage to your dog that your dog will be afraid of strangers. Why? Because the last time you brought in a person to take care of your dog, the dog suffered with it. And then you hire a pet sitter because you're going to go for vacation. And that dog will hate the pet sitter because he's another one who of, of your decision to come in and take care from you while you're gone. So the dog has actually PTSD from his previous experience. People come in to take care of me. They suck. Don't leave me alone. And suddenly the dog has separation anxiety. Suddenly the dog doesn't want to go in a crate. Why? Because the pet sitter kind of forced the dog into the crate. The, <coughs> <coughs> the dog made a U-turn and attacked the pet sitter. And of course, you kind of like, wait, my dog is not resisting the crate. Of course not for you. But the pet sitter didn't take the dog out long enough for a walk. The dog didn't poop enough. And the dog is not ready to go back in the crate. And he thinks like he needs to stay longer outside. And he's going to throw a fight. And that person gets hurt. And your house is gone. Or the dog is being put down. It's your choice. Right? <clears throat> so to kind of get kind of a better overview. You hire a professional, you need to know that this professional is professional. If you hire a professional because you think you can get away with an inexpensive version of it, you put the professional at your dog at risk. So if your dogs are reactive, hire a trainer to help you with that and have the pet sitter join the training so the pet sitter knows what to do because the professional told the professional what to do. You're out of the hook because it's being taken care of. Okay. If you hire a trainer to train your dog in your absence, you put your dog at risk. If you hire a pet sitter to do a training job or a behaviorist job, you put your dog and your house at risk. Well, the professional is own fault because he knows what he's doing. He's supposed to, but he doesn't anyway, but the problem happens is if you don't say things, you make things appear normal. Oh, don't you see? My dog is fine with the kids, but the dog just came from rescue and is only been a couple of months at your property <clears throat> and make an assumption that things are just fine because nothing happened so far because you magically walk around the threshold and around the triggers because you don't use a doorbell and you don't do this because you know what is going to happen and you explain that a pet sitter and the pet sitter has to remember all your logic. It's not going to happen. It's going to make a mistake. <clears throat> I remember I took a job on a couple of years back. I had three pages of explanation what exactly to do. And I was like, it's that was an example of controlling. He's not only controlling the dogs, he was controlling also me. I couldn't even do my job right. He was telling me how to put my shoes on the side and how to which dog to put the leash first on. And I get it. That was totally nice and right. And then how to feed the dogs. It was like just reading those books of explanation every time I was there. It was like spending 15 minutes just reading the document and trying to understand what's going on here because, of course, it changed because Monday is different, Tuesday is different, Friday is different, and Saturday Sunday is different. Um, I mean, it was good money, but Jesus, <laughs> it was a lot to work on, and it didn't make any sense. Anyway, accidents like this where people get hurt and ruined for the rest of their lives, cannot happen again. 
We just need more conscious about it. <clears throat> Don't make the assumptions that a dog will be nice to everyone just because he was nice to everyone when you were there. Don't expect other people to do exactly like you do. It's technically impossible. Thank you. Good question. What about leaving a dog with family members at their house? Assuming the dog knows the family and the house well, I'm very reluctant to leave my dog with anyone I understand is necessary at times. <clears throat> um, I, have th I think the right answer to that would be you have to make a choice based on how the dog feels about it. And I know many people who did that mistake, hired the brother or the sister, and, you know, they just wanted to do a favor, you know. And the real reason for that is they didn't have enough time to find a good professional. It's a slippery slope because what will happen if your family member loses the dog? So I wouldn't risk that the first shot. I would say, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to work in the morning, okay? I'm going to have lunch with my colleagues. I will be in town, and I would like you to go and take out my dogs. Dear sister, dear brother, dear grandmother, dear mother, dear dad, dear uncle. Okay? And be on call. Not on silence, on call. And explain them what to do. In the meantime, get yourself a little camera and put in the house. Tell the people, hey, I have a camera here to observe the dogs. And check in with them. You know, family is family. Sometimes family is because it's family. It's like, yeah, whatever. It's, it's, the dogs are fine. I'm just 10 minutes late or 20 minutes late. <laughs> Who's going to know? right? And the disaster will happen because the dog is so urgent to go to the bathroom, he's going to bolt out the door. And he's expecting you to come in and suddenly somebody else is there. Add safety features. There's no big deal getting $70, $80, $100, a, a door baby gate safety gate that goes around the door jam so you can open the door without the dog having access to the door. Problem solved. You can get in and out safely. The dog will not get through the fence and through the door so you cannot bolt out the door. Making sure your gear is correctly. The harness is right. The leash is correct. I had a client giving me a leash and I was stupid enough in the beginning not thinking about it. I kind of like have a bad feeling but it was kind of those leashes like with the sport club on it and it's like his favorite he wants to see the pictures of his dog with that leash on you know go figure and i fall for it right and what happened is the dog bolted for some reason and the leash broke and i was like with the end of the leash and the dog had the other end of the leash <laughs> like shit <laughs> but that goes go wrong because the dog may hit by a car i have to pay for it and by the way just in case you don't know what's the liability for losing or killing your dog <laughs> $350 give and take unless you sue me for more and the insurance will say well you know your dog was a mutt so you're not getting anything or you know what it's not the person's fault because the leash broke material fatigue blame the leash manufacturer and you will not get your dog back so don't rely on the other one's insurance Oh, yeah, you need to have insurance just in case something happens with your dog, but it will not replace your dog. Okay? So, the answer to the question, Jeff, do a test run and have your back covered. Put a camera on, hook it on your Wi-Fi, have somebody do that for you if you don't know how to do that, and let your family member coming home and love and care and family, everything is great. You just put the camera in there to make sure the dog doesn't have separation anxiety and leave it there. And then watch what time is it going? What time is it leaving? You know, are the following instructions? So you can tell them, hey, I know my dog is a little bit of a weirdo, but I would like you to keep that schedule in place so my dog gets not even more weirdo than he already is. The other thing that I would like you to think about is a contingency, contingency plan. I need more coffee. What happens if one system fails? I have another story for that. I took care of a great Dane who had a medical condition and he wasn't having medication. And I would visit this house three times a day. And my job was very clear. 
start on Monday, finish on Friday, okay? Saturday, Sunday, the grandparents or whatever parents will come in. And then I will take over the job on Monday until the next Friday. So it was a two-week package minus the weekend. And everything was fine. And they told me by the end of the day, I should put the key in the mailbox and let you drop in. The mailbox was inside the house so that nobody else would have access to it. And um, I'm finishing the second week and I leave the house. And I had a guts feeling. I was like... So I text the people. I says, hey, guys, um, how about you check in with me when you return from the airport? Mm, well, the day ended, and I didn't have a phone call yet. <clears throat> and then I was worried about it. So I called the grandparents who was there, and I says, hey, when are your people coming back home? Oh, next week. Like, wait, what next week? My project ends today, and I haven't called them back. They haven't called me back yet, and you tell me they're coming back next week. Who's going to take care of the dog? Oh, I thought you're going to take care of the dog. Like, no, my here, here's my dates. This is my book me from week one and week two. There is no week three, right? So lucky, because the dog had to be on medication, and it was for his life situation, they came back from their old weekend house, came back to the town I was working with, it took him an hour to drive there, to give me the key for the house so I can take care of the dog. I saved the dog's life because I listened to my guts. So you have to listen to your guts. If you're a professional, a trainer, a pet sitter, or a client, guts feelings. Always listen to them, never fails. Now, Patty is very interesting. There are many people out there who also have fosters, okay? And they want to take foster care. What do you do as a foster? Let's say, for example, your kid got sick and you need to go to the hospital. Who's going to take care of your foster dogs? Where is that contingency plan? What if the pet sitter fails to come to your property? Do you have a backup plan? Right? So I've seen many people. I got. I always have my website back then. I had an emergency number. If you have a problem, call me. Don't book. We can book later. Now call me. So a pet sitter didn't show up because he forgot about it. And the dogs were in the house. And they were yelling and screaming and barking. So the neighbor called the owner and says, hey, dude, your dog is barking like crazy. You're going to call the cops or something. And the pet sitter says, well, I cannot get my pet sitter on the hold. What's going on? And I said, well, you know what? I, I'm going to stop by. He gave me the code. I got the key from the reception and everything was fine. Because he had a contingency plan. I was not available for that job, but I gave him a number just in case something goes wrong. And I made time for him and I stopped by and took care of his dogs. Well, he appreciated me and I got more pay than I ever thought about it. <clears throat> but he was smart. He had a contingency plan. There is a spare key with the somebody person so he can help me out. So as a foster, things are more tricky because... A rescue has you as a foster and primary caretaker. You sign papers for it. So if you need a replacement, don't just hire a pet sitter. Go through your rescue and discuss what the backup plan is. Long story short, I worked with the rescue in the past, and they called me. Hey, we have a you know, foster who is, has to go on vacation, and can you take care of the dogs for two weeks? I'm like, okay. So the people came and they brought the dog in a kennel, a very small kennel, too small. Um, okay. And they look, got me a lot of food. And I was like, for two weeks, I don't need so much food. Why don't you just put in a little Ziploc bag? It's going to end up for that. Ah, oh, don't worry about it. Um, my gut feeling told me like, hmm, that story stinks. Anyway, those people never came back to pick up the dog after three months and I quit my working with that rescue because they lied to me. Basically, they just dumped the dog on me because the foster said, I'm dropping the dog, I'm leaving, right? And the foster told me, or the, the rescue told me, like, temporary, but it wasn't temporary. It was, like, forever. Anyway, um, all these things can happen. But as a foster, as a rescue, you need to have this backup plan. No, this person have a dedicated pet sitter on hand. They can handle the rescue dogs. Rescue dogs who come from rescue, especially the first month or two, are going through a transition trauma, right? 
And that transition trauma, meaning is the dog has been relocated from point A to point B. And they just lost their home. Somebody took them away from the home, brought them into another house. And all of a sudden, the pet sitter becomes the trigger for that PTSD response. Because the dog may think that I'm being left behind and these people come and take me. Okay? Now, the dog can have separation anxiety. The dog can have aggressive reaction because it doesn't want the person to come in and take the dogs away. So sometimes you have to be proactive and start working a couple of times. Take you and the pet sitter, the dogs out for a walk, okay? And bring uh, back the dog with you and then start doing switching who's bringing back the dog so the dog gets comfortable about that, okay? And don't just leave the pet sitter dealing with an aggressive dog because the dog thinks it's going to be put down or taking away from his house. So I just finished eight days with two miniature poodles, two indoor bunnies. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, yeah, good. I love those. I had that gig once with a, with a belly pig. Uh, pig be, be, pot belly pig. I got it. <laughs> the boar managed to rip open the part. Ooh, oh, yeah, okay. This is a house in a suburban neighborhood, and rounding up large pigs is not any... I'm with you, man. Um... Yeah, I remember I took a job uh, a job on in in Washington D.C. Yeah, Washington D.C. And um, the funny part was I also dealt with a pig who was aggressive to the dogs. So I was hired as a pet sitter and a trainer to pet sit the dogs, <laughs> train the pig. That was fun, uh, but it was a very good experience. Um, yeah, and you know I know many many people are afraid of hiring a pet sitter, but here's the reality. You, sometimes you don't find a pet sitter to handle complicated dogs. Then you have to find a veterinarian office or a kennel that has a kennel run. Hear me out here. A kennel run that has an attached kennel, like a kennel plus run attached to it, where people don't have to take the dog out, where the dog can stay in the run. Is it a good situation? Of course not. It's the worst case scenario. But it's better than hiring somebody who doesn't have a clue and put your dog at risk. Now, the other thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you have a big size kennel that's appropriate for your dog. So if you have a Mastiff or a Great Dane or a Pyrenees or a whatever Appalachian herding dog, what you want to put is proper size kennel. Now, the normal kennels, the three by three or five by five, are not big enough for the dogs to stay all day long in there and have like half an hour outrage. So some are smart. They have special bigger cages for big dogs and they're rare. Okay. So see if you can make arrangements. But if you don't have an option, that's a safe way to go. Because those have a feeding drawer. You can put food in and close the door. So even worst case scenario, the dog goes nuts and wants to kill anyone. The dog is safe. And people are safe. Okay? If your dog is one of those dogs, you have to enter back door to get into the kennel. Make sure you tell those people that. So the dog is not near the door. He's away from the door. So not all the 50 dogs have to pass his kennel because he's going to be dead by the end of the day because he's going to go nuts in the kennel. Make sense? So all these things are there. So if you if you have a problem and you need more knowledge around that, I'm happy to sit down with you. We're gonna we're gonna schedule an appointment for an hour and I'm gonna walk you through all these processes. What what exactly is going on? We're gonna talk about your dog, we're gonna talk about your dog's behavior issues, we're gonna talk about what is the route, best route to go. Okay. And some people don't have time to make those arrangements. What is the backup plan? Okay. And yeah, sometimes it's helpful if you leave the pet sitter my phone number. I'm going to charge you later anyway. <laughs> so, so at least your pet sitter has a person to call to get help. I've done this a couple of times. It's not my specialty. There's no specialty on taking calls of other professionals fixing the mess. Um, but it's a good thing to do is to have a backup plan. Okay? And sometimes... We have to educate our own people to take care of the dogs. There are specific exercises in place to help the dog create a good attachment relationship with 
your family members who are not family. Even if it's your close family and the dog sees them very often, he still is not considered family. Right? And when I need to say one thing, sometimes we put ourselves in a difficult position. We are sabotaging ourselves, putting the situation that is so we kind of suffer with it. It happens sometimes. Um, I know people who, who work with dogs, and I'm one of them who basically put myself in a, in a difficult position because I couldn't get out of my brain at some times, right? It was very helpful for somebody to point it out, and that was very helpful. So if you need help, you're welcome to go to my website, holisticdogtraining.org, click on training, click on online training, and then select one of those options. I would say take an online intake or behavior assessment, either or. Um, the online intake uh, is about 45 minutes and the behavior assessment is 45 it's it's an hour gives us more room to work things out and all of them come in with a solution it's not just talking stuff it's actually putting together a plan to work things out so thanks for watching and i appreciate your questions um welcome to share it and um yeah and you know stay safe out there And the final part, I still have some coffee left. COVID dogs are more complicated than you ever thought of. Dogs who have been through COVID are not socialized, are very stressed in general. They have no morals and ethics in place, very rare. Okay, Some dogs have been through the rescue, have been through a second COVID round of rehoming and you eventually don't know it and these are potential problem makers so be aware i'm just putting it out there so thanks again have a great rest of your weekend talk to you soon